Don't forget to like and subscribe. It really helps with the algorithm. Thanks. Content warning. The following video contains material that may be harmful or traumatizing to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. The Fritzl case came to light in 2008, it shocked the world and with a good reason. It is one of the most disturbing and horrifying cases in history. The more you learn about the Fritzl case, the more disturbing it gets. The Perpetrator Joseph Fritzl was born on the 9th of April 1935, in Amstetten, Upper Austria. Joseph's father abandoned the family when he was just four years of age. He was raised by his working mother, whom he stated never showed any love for him, and was an abusive parent that used to beat him. Unfortunately, as it happens in many cases, children that were abused as a child, later become abusers as parents themselves. Quote. My mother was a servant and she used to work hard all her life, I never had a kiss from her, I was never cuddled although I wanted it, I wanted her to be good to me. He also claimed that she called him a Satan, a criminal, a no good and that he had a horrible fear of her. In 1956, at the age of 21, he married Rosemary, 17 years of age at the time. As a trade Joseph was an electrical mechanical engineer, he completed an HEL technical college and later worked several years in a company in Linz. He also worked in a construction material firm and later as a salesman for technical equipment. While working on these different trading jobs, Joseph acquired knowledge that later he would put to use when it came to build the infamous prison chamber. In 1959, after his marriage and after had bought the house, Joseph brought his mother, Maria Fritzl, home. Joseph had a bad relationship as a child with her, she used to mistreat him. But when she moved in, he was the one who started mistreating her. Later on, he admitted to having locked his mother in the attic and bricked the windows after he had told the neighbor she had died. It is believed he kept his mother locked in the attic for 20 years until the time of her death in 1980. I have no doubts a man like Joseph Fritzl would be able to lock his own mother for 20 years. But if we take into consideration the timeline, the numbers do not add up. Joseph was arrested in 1967 and stayed in prison for a whole year. Unless his wife Rosemary was his accomplice, if his mother was really locked in the attic all that time, she would have starved to death. I believe he could have locked her up in the last years of her life, 
but not the 20 years as some people claimed. 1966. In 1966, Elizabeth Fritzel was born, the fourth of seven children from the couple. She was sister to two brothers and four sisters. 1967. In 1967, Fritzel committed his first known predatorial sex crime. When Joseph was a 32 years old man and the father of four children himself, he raped a 24 years old nurse from Linz. He broke into the house of the woman while her husband was away, held a knife to her throat, and told her he would kill her if she would scream. For this crime, he served 12 of an 18 month sentence. According to Austrian law, criminal records are deleted from the archives after 15 years. This was a loophole in the system that later on would play in Fritzl's favor. In that same year, he was also suspected of having raped a 21 years old woman and was accused of indecent exposure. Now that we know all the full extents of his crimes, we know for sure he never repented or regretted any of them. What he did was learn from his mistakes, and while incarcerated, he became more cunning and ruthless. He still wanted and planned to commit the crimes. He just got wiser to make sure he wouldn't be caught again. The Crime 1977 the crime goes far back as 1977 when Joseph Fritzl started sexually abusing her daughter Elizabeth Fritzl. Joseph was 42 and Elizabeth was only 11. With time, Joseph grew obsessed with her. He would control every minute of her life, ask her to whom she had talked to, go through her belongings, and read from her diaries. He was a control freak, a sex predator obsessed with his daughter, but since everything happened closed doors, no one ever noticed. 1978. The Bunker. In 1978, Joseph asked for a building permit to rebuild the basement in his house. The Cold War between the U.S. and Russia happened between 1941 and 1991. At that time, it was not just normal to believe a nuclear war could happen, it was actually normal to believe it was unavoidable. So many people who lived in that period built underground bunkers under their homes. With this excuse, Joseph applied for the construction permit in his basement. 1980. Joseph Fritzl's mother, Maria Fritzl died in 1980. 1981-1982. Between 1981-1982, Fritzl began illegally enlarging the basement and created a secret passage to a hidden room no one but he knew about. In this secret area, he started to build what later would be the prison chamber. In it, he installed a washbasin, toilet, bed, hot plate, and refrigerator. The access point to the secret chamber was concealed by a shelf. During this period, Elizabeth completed her compulsory education at the age of 15 and enlisted in a course to become a waitress. Later she also started a part-time job in a gas station. 1983 1983, at this time Elizabeth had been sexually abused by her father for years, and she understood it wouldn't stop until she was out of his control. She was a vulnerable child, utterly dominated by her tyrannical father, and terrified of him and what he could do if she would ever reveal the sex abuses to other people. She saw herself trapped in a difficult situation with no one she could turn for help. So she did what everyone in her situation would do. As soon as she was old enough, she tried to escape from home. In January 1983, at the age of 17, Elizabeth ran away from home and went into hiding in Vienna with a friend from work. She was found by police three weeks later, brought back home, and delivered to her parents. Also, in 1983, Joseph had completed most of the construction in the basement. Inspectors visited the site and did not find the illegal door connecting to the secret chamber. So they validate the work done as in concordance with the specification of the construction plans. 1984, the beginning of captivity. In 1984, Elizabeth completed her course as a waitress. She found a job near Linz and told her father she was moving out of the house to live with her older sister. It was the opportunity she was waiting since she was a child. Elizabeth was a beautiful young woman of 18 years of age. She had her whole life ahead, and she was about to start her new life away from her tyrannical, sex predator father. But Joseph had already anticipated this possibility. This was what he feared the most. Not just he was going to lose his power over her, 
as he was afraid once she was no longer under his control, she could speak about the sexual abuse that had been happening closed doors. On the 28th of August 1984, after Elizabeth turned 18, Joseph asked her to help him bring a door to the basement. This door was the last piece Joseph needed to enclose her in the cellar. While Elizabeth had his back turned to him, he soaked a towel with ether and pressed it against her face until she lost consciousness. Joseph handcuffed her, dragged her to the interior of the cellar, and locked the door. After her disappearance, Elizabeth's mother, Rosemary Fritzel, filed a missing person report at the police station. A month later, Fritzel brought a letter to the police. It had been posted from Braunau, another Austrian town 160 kilometers or 99 miles away from Amstetten. It was a letter written by Elizabeth, stating she was tired of living with her family and was staying with a friend. She warned her parents not to look for her or she would leave the country. Joseph told the police he believed she had joined a religious cult. But later it was discovered in truth, Joseph had forced Elizabeth to write the letter. Elizabeth woke up handcuffed in a small, dark room in the cellar. From this time until her was released in 2008, Joseph would descend to the cellar to rape her on a regular basis. It was a 24 years long torture with rapes happening almost daily. From this point on, Joseph started to live two separate lives. One with his wife Rosemary in the house upstairs and another secret life with her sex slave and daughter Elizabeth in the cellar. All of this without anyone suspecting of anything. The cellar. The sealed chamber Elizabeth was confined had a total of 35 square meters or 380 square feet of habitable space with no windows. The cellar had a washbasin, toilet, bed, a hot plate, and refrigerator so Elizabeth could cook and store food. Joseph would go shopping and bring her groceries or other supplies she needed. 1986 In 1986, when Elizabeth was 20 years of age, she became pregnant for the first time. In November of the same year, she suffered a miscarriage and lost the baby, she was 10 weeks pregnant. 1988. Two years later, on 30 August 1988, Elizabeth delivered her first child. It was a girl she named Kirsten. Kirsten would grow and live in the cellar until her release in 2008, when she was 19 years of age. Kirsten spent her entire childhood locked in the cellar. Apart from television, she grew up without seeing the outside world, and never saw or was exposed to sunlight. When Elizabeth found out she was pregnant with Kristen, she asked her father for help. He refused to let her out to see a doctor and also refused to be present during childbirth. Elizabeth had to deliver the child by herself with no one to help her. The only Joseph did was bring her a book about pregnancy, a clean towel, and a new pair of scissors to cut the umbilical cord at the end. Until this moment, apart from the regular visits of her father to rape her, Elizabeth had spent four years alone. 1990. On 1 February 1990, Elizabeth delivered her second child, a boy named Stefan. Stefan would suffer the same fate as his older sister, he too would remain incarcerated in the cellar until his release in 2008. Once again, Elizabeth had to deliver the baby alone because Joseph refused to help her. Elizabeth was 24 years of age. 1992. On 29 August 1992, Elizabeth delivered her third child, a girl named Lisa. Now, with Elizabeth plus three children, the small cellar was becoming too crowded. For this reason, Joseph concocted a plan to bring the new baby girl upstairs to join his other family. He made Elizabeth write a note stating that the child was hers, and they had to take care of the baby because she could not look after her. 1993. In May 1993, when Lisa was just nine months old, Joseph put the baby in cardboard together with the letter written by Elizabeth and left the baby at the entrance of his house. His wife Rosemary heard the baby crying, found it, and brought it inside. She read the letter and fell for the deception, she thought it was Elizabeth who had left the baby at the entrance and ran away again. Since Lisa was officially their granddaughter, Joseph and his wife applied to foster the child. Joseph was a convicted sex offender, and under Austrian law, no sex offender is allowed to foster a child. Yet, Joseph took advantage of a gap in the system and the petition was granted. According to Austrian law, any criminal record is erased after 15 years. Joseph was a convicted rapist in 1967, 26 years before the petition. The result is that the record was erased and the social services never had access to this information. 
The social services accepted the request, so the baby was raised upstairs while her mother and siblings lived downstairs locked in the cellar. Living in the cellar remained Elizabeth, now a 27 years old woman, Kirsten around 5 years and Stefan 3. Elizabeth had been incarcerated for 9 years and the two children all their lives. All lived in the same 35 square meters area since the beginning of the ordeal, and as the kids grew, it was obvious the space was too little for them. So after many requests from Elizabeth, finally her father Joseph accepted to enlarge the prison size. Elizabeth and her children had to dig out the soil with their bare hands, and the enlargement took years to complete. The cellar prison went from 35 square meters, 380 square feet, to 55 square meters, 600 square feet, after the work was done. Joseph would fill bags with dirt, drive an hour in his car, and dump them away from home so no one could see it. In the cellar, they had a television, a radio, and a video cassette player. To punish them, Joseph would shut off the lights or refuse to deliver food to them for days at a time. To prevent the escape of Elizabeth and the children, Joseph would often tell them that there was a gas pipeline connected to the cellar, and if they ever would try to escape, they would be gassed. He also told them that the entrance door was electrified. If any of them would ever try to open the door, they would suffer an electrical discharge and die instantaneously. Later, it was verified that they were empty threats, but it worked to scare them and prevent them from trying to escape. It is also important to mention the remarkable work done by Elizabeth to raise the children. Not just she went through the ordeal without going insane, as she worked hard to give her children as much of a normal life as she could. Elizabeth asked her father to bring her books, and she taught the kids how to read, write, and even taught them math and other subjects. The doctors and caregivers who took care of the family after their release stated they were surprised about how well educated and polite the children were, especially taking into consideration what they went through. 1994. On the 26th of February 1994, Elizabeth's fourth child was born. Another baby girl she named Monica. Monica was also removed from the cellar and brought upstairs to join the upstairs family. Joseph would transfer the babies at an earlier age before they could talk or be able to understand what was happening around them. In this way, the children wouldn't be able to say anything about what was happening in the basement. So in December 1994, Monica was found in a pushchair at the entrance of the house. Rosemary received a phone call asking her to take care of the child. She stated it was a female voice and it resembled Elizabeth's voice. It is believed that Joseph wrote a letter and made Elizabeth read it while he recorded her voice on a cassette tape. Then he drove away from home to a public phone and used a tape recording to make the call. Rosemary reported the incident to the police and expressed she was astonished because Elizabeth knew their new, unlisted phone number. This was a mistake done by Joseph that if further investigated, could have led to an earlier liberation of the captives in the cellar. But unfortunately went nowhere. The police dismissed the detail pointed out by Rosemary, and they never looked into it. 1996. On 28 of April 1996, Elizabeth gave birth to twin boys. Michael and Alexander. Michael was born with physical problems and didn't stop crying. Elizabeth told Joseph that there was something wrong with the boy and asked him to take him to the hospital. Joseph ignored her pleads and left the boy slowly dying. Michael died three days later after his birth. Fritzel took the body upstairs and cremated it on the stove used to heat the house. Later it was found if brought to the hospital, the child would have survived. The surviving twin, Alexander, remained with Elizabeth for a little longer, then he too was brought upstairs. 1997. Fifteen months after the birth of the twins, Alexander was then brought upstairs by Joseph to join Lisa and Monica. He was also found at the entrance of the house like his two older sisters and raised by her grandmother, Rosemary. 2002. On 16th of December 2002, Elizabeth's seventh child was born. It was a baby boy Elizabeth named Felix. In a later statement, Joseph explained that his wife Rosemary couldn't look after another child. So baby Felix was raised with her mother in the basement. In the cellar lived now Elizabeth, 36 years of age, Kirsten 14. Stefan 12, and Felix, a newborn child. At this point, Elizabeth has spent 18 years of her life locked in the prison chamber, Kirsten and Stefan their entire lives. Upstairs was Lisa 10 years of age, Monica 8, and Alexander 6. 
Elizabeth also said Joseph was a sadist. He would often bring photos of the children upstairs to show them to their siblings in the basement. Photos of barbecues, Christmas, and birthday parties at the pool. And he would often tell them how happy and how much fun they were having. Elizabeth stated Joseph would do this just to torture the children. He would also force her to watch pornographic movies and later reenact what they saw in those same movies in front of the children. She said he would do this with the only purpose of humiliating her. Holidays. Fritzel was so confident his dark secrets would never be revealed, he even went on holiday while Elizabeth and the children were locked up in the cellar. This footage of him was taken in a resort in Thailand. Two thousand eight. In two thousand eight, Kirsten became severely ill and fell unconscious. Elizabeth asked Joseph to take her to the hospital, and he did it. Much had been debated about why he accepted, knowing that probably his secret life would be uncovered. But thankfully, he agreed to do it. On the nineteenth of April two thousand eight, Joseph arranged for Kirsten to be taken to the local hospital. Elizabeth helped Joseph to bring Kirsten outside the cellar and she saw the outside world for the first time in 24 years. Right away, he ordered Elizabeth to return inside. She obeyed and spent another week in the cellar. When Kirsten arrived at the hospital by ambulance, she left everyone shocked with her appearance. We are talking about a young adult of 19 years of age who had never been exposed to the light of the sun. The health professionals who took care of her said they had never seen a person looking so pale like her. They described her as having a ghost-like appearance. Kirsten was admitted to the hospital suffering from a life-threatening kidney failure. She was slowly dying, and the doctors didn't know what to do to help her. They needed information about Kirsten's medical history and what had happened to her before she fell ill, but no one was there to tell them. Then the medical staff tried to identify the girl in the registers, but she was not registered anywhere they looked. It was as if Kirsten had never existed. Later on that same day, Joseph arrived at the hospital claiming to have found a note written by Elizabeth, and he discussed Kirsten's condition with the physicians. The medical staff found many aspects of Joseph's story strange and they called the police on the 21st of April. They reported the incident, and they asked the police to locate urgently Kirsten's mother, so she could provide the information they needed to save Kirsten's life. The investigation. The police reopened the case on Elizabeth's disappearance, and made a media public appeal asking the mother to come forward to talk to the doctors. Was erhoffen Sie sich jetzt von unserem Interview? Ich würde mir wünschen, dass die Mutter mit uns Kontakt aufnimmt und werden vielleicht damit einen Schritt weiter in unserer Diagnostik und Behandlung kommen. When Joseph was interrogated by the police, he repeated the same story he told at the hospital. He showed them what he claimed to be the last letter he received from Elizabeth. It was dated January 2008, and it had been posted from the town of Kematen. Kematen is located 60 kilometers or 37 miles away from Amstetten, and 100 kilometers or 62 miles away from Braunau, which is the location of the first letter they supposedly received from Elizabeth in the year 1984 when she first went missing. The police contacted Manfred Wolfart, a church officer and expert on cults. He raised the doubts about the existence of such a cult Joseph affirmed Elizabeth was involved and pointed out that the letter had been oddly written. He said that the letter seemed to have been dictated by someone else. All the clues were pointing in Joseph's direction and the police started making pressure on him to tell the truth. Joseph panicked. His secret life was about to be exposed, and he was afraid of the consequences. So he made one last desperate attempt to prevent his 24-year life of dark secrets to be revealed to the world. On the 26th of April, Joseph released Elizabeth, Stefan, and Felix from the cellar and brought them upstairs. He told his wife Elizabeth had finally decided to return home after 24 years of being absent. Elizabeth asked Joseph to take her to the hospital. 
He took her to the hospital, and while in the presence of her father, Elizabeth talked to the physicians in the care for Kirsten. She gave them a few answers, and she told them what Joseph said to her to tell them. But her explanation seemed strange, and the physicians understood she was lying, so they called the police again and then told them that Elizabeth and Joseph were at the hospital. The police rushed to the hospital, apprehended Joseph and Elizabeth, and took them to the police station to be interviewed. It was only after they had promised her she would never have to see her father again that she finally opened up and told them her story. It was a two hours narration of the last 24 years of her life locked inside the cellar. The story was so surreal, the police officers had difficulties believing in her. Initially, they thought she was the one who was the abusive parent, and now she was lying because she was afraid of the consequences. Meanwhile, a police officer was told to return to the house and pick up the two siblings from the house that had come with Elizabeth, Stefan, and Felix. While driving from the house to the police station, the police officer said that Felix looked extremely fascinated with whatever he saw from the car's window. The sky, the trees, the people, and the birds, everything was amazing for the little boy. When they were finally released from their prison, Elizabeth now a 42-year-old woman, had spent 24 years of her life locked inside the cellar, and the three children with her their entire lives, Kirsten 19 years, Stefan 17 years, and little Felix 5 years. On the 26th of April, Joseph Fritzl, aged 73, was arrested on suspicion of serious crimes committed against his family members. Among them, it included false imprisonment, rape, manslaughter by negligence, and incest. The point of view of the criminal police, the missing person case Elizabeth Fritzl, can now be deemed resolved. Nevertheless, police investigations will be continued. On the 27th of April, Elizabeth, her children, and her mother were taken to a clinic to undergo physical and mental treatment. Joseph told the police how to enter the hidden electronic door that led to the prison chamber and gave them the entry code. The investigators who entered the cellar described it as the stuff of nightmares. They became shocked by the inhumane living conditions Elizabeth and her children were living. To reach the prison chamber, the investigators had to go through five locked basement rooms and cross eight doors, including two doors that were secured with electronic locking devices. The living area of the cellar had five meters long, 16 feet, corridor, a storeroom, and three small open areas connected by narrow corridors. The cellar had a cooking area, bathroom, and two sleeping areas. The total area was approximately 55 square meters, 590 square feet. Rosemary Fritzl stated she was unaware of what was happening in the cellar. On the 29th of April, DNA tests confirmed Joseph was the father of all six of Elizabeth's children. I have been in many Austrian cellars, because of the terrain and the construction materials, cellars in Austria are humid, cold and they have an unpleasant odor, regardless if there's a window open or not. Cellars in Austrian are compartments that one goes there once in a while to drop a box or something unnecessary, and get out of there as quickly as possible. They are unpleasant places to spend time. Imagine the situation of being locked in a place that's small, dark, claustrophobic, with a low ceiling, no windows, no sunlight, no fresh air, no people to talk to, and no outdoor activities. Now imagine living like that for 24 years. It's remarkable Elizabeth survived the ordeal without losing her mind. The Liberation Letter it has been reported that prior to Elizabeth and her children's liberation, which happened in 2008, Joseph made her write a letter stating she wanted to return home, but it was not the right time. Some people have speculated Joseph was planning to liberate Elizabeth and the children back then. To explain her sudden return, he would have made it as if they had run away from the imaginary satanic cult and had returned home. I seriously doubt Joseph had ever intended to release them. I am sure their relationship must have been extremely tense at times. Surely at breaking points, she might have refused to cooperate regardless of the threats and the punishment inflicted by him. The letter could have been just a mechanism to ease the tension between them and make her more cooperative once again. 
A manipulator uses many strategies to keep his victims under control. Punishment or reward are often used as strategies to control the victim. When fear doesn't work, the manipulator might momentaneously shift the reward, or fake reward, to increase hope and extend the period the victim is being under control. More likely the idea of the letter occurred when the relationship in the cellar was so tense that Joseph understood he needed to do something to remove the tension in the cellar. The letter might have raised their hopes for liberation, and the mood was released from tension. But more likely, he never intended to release them. Elizabeth and the children were his property, and he knew perfectly well their liberation would represent his doom. Joseph's Explanations Some explanations Joseph gave to his despicable acts would be laughable if the case was not as disturbing as it is. Quote 1. I am not the beast the media make me to be. Unquote. Then he proceeded explaining he didn't treat the captives in the cellar as bad as people thought. He said he brought flowers for Elizabeth, and books and toys for the children. He also added that sometimes he would watch videos and have meals with them. Quote 2. I always knew during the whole 24 years that what I was doing was not right, that I must have been crazy to do such a thing, yet it became a normal occurrence to lead a second life in the basement of my house." Unquote. Fritzl explained he never raped his daughter, for him, it was consented sex. Then he explained the reason he imprisoned Elizabeth. He said she was growing unruly, difficult to control, and that she was vulnerable to the outside world. So he had to lock her in the cellar for her own protection. Quote 3. She did not adhere to any rules anymore when she became a teenager. That is why I had to do something, I had to create a place where I could keep Elizabeth, by force if necessary, away from the outside world. Unquote. Then he suggested that the emphasis on discipline he received during the Nazi era might have influenced his views about decency and good behavior. These statements made by Joseph were so divorced from reality that many thought Joseph's lawyer was plotting to appeal to a verdict of non-guilty for the reason of insanity. The state cannot punish a mentally ill individual who does not distinguish the difference between good or bad. But Joseph was perfectly aware of his actions. He said it himself. Quote, I always knew during the whole 24 years that what I was doing was not right. Unquote. He also reinforced this statement with every action he took. He did everything he could to keep his crimes concealed from the public eye. And used every manipulation technique known by men to avoid raising suspicions about him. These were clear proofs he was perfectly conscious of his actions. But later on, he did admit that he had locked his daughter, not for discipline but for his own gratification. Regardless of what he might say, Joseph Fritzl is a sex predator, and he is not fit to live in society. He has to be locked down and separated from normal people for the rest of his life. The Trial On November 13, 2008, Joseph was charged with negligent murder of his newborn son Michael, as well as rape, incest, kidnapping, false imprisonment, and slavery. Joseph Fritzl's trial started on the 16th of March, 2009. During the first day, Joseph tried to hide his face from the cameras, using a blue folder to prevent photographers from taking pictures, which the Austrian law allowed him to do. When the journalist and the public were asked to leave the room, Joseph then lowered the folder. In the open statements made by the defense lawyer, he asked the jury to be objective. He stated that Joseph Fritzl was not the monster described by the media. Then he explained his statements by saying that Joseph brought a Christmas tree to the cellar during the holiday season. The prosecutor demonstrated the low height of the ceiling by making a mark on the door of the courtroom, and he described the cellar as damp and moldy. Then he presented the juries with a box of musty objects collected from the cellar, and made the juries pass the objects between them. The odor of the objects was so unpleasant it made the jurors flinch. To spare the already traumatized family members from the ordeal of the trial, the victims were spared from being physically present in the courtroom. On July 11, 2008, Elizabeth Fritz's testimony was recorded on videotape and showed to the jurors. It was a total of 11 hours of testimony. It was described to be so distressful that the juries couldn't watch it for more than two hours at the time. Elizabeth's older brother, Harold Fritzl, 
also testified and described the physical abuse he suffered as a child at the hands of his father, Joseph Fritzl. He also stated that when Elizabeth was 12, she started telling him about the sexual abuse she was suffering from her father. He said that Elizabeth told him that Joseph had touched her in inappropriate places. Harold explained he did nothing because anything he could try would only result in a beating from his father. Rosemary and the other children refused to testify. On the 18th of March 2009, Elizabeth attended secretly the second day of trial in preparation for a book she was planning to write. She did not expect to see her father. Yet it is reported that Joseph knew she was coming, so he looked for her among the assistants. It is said that after their eyes met, he became pale and started to break down. On the next day, he approached the judge and changed his plea from not guilty to guilty. On the 19th of March 2009, Joseph Fritzl, 73 years of age, pleaded guilty to the charges of murder by the negligence of his infant son and grandson Michael, he also pleaded guilty to the decades-long enslavement, incest, rape, coercion, and false imprisonment. Herr Fritzl, wie werden Sie sich heute verantworten? Gibt es eine Antwort auf die Frage nach dem Warum? Herr Fritzl, wie werden Sie sich denn heute verantworten? Sie haben Verfahren? Warum möchten Sie heute nichts sagen? Heute hätten Sie die Herr Fritzl, wie hat denn das damals angefangen? Können Sie dazu eine Erklärung abgeben? Haben Sie eine Erklärung nach dem Warum? Das ist, was sich viele Menschen fragen. Gegenstand der heutigen Schwurgerichtsverhandlung ist die gegen Josef Fritzl erhobene Anklage der Staatsanwaltschaft St. Pölten wegen mehrerer Verbrechen nach dem österreichischen Strafgesetzbuch. Demnach steht Josef Fritzl unter dem Verdacht, für den selbstverständlich die in Österreich im Strafgesetz. The sentence. Joseph was sentenced to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole in 15 years. He accepted the sentence and said he did not plan to appeal the verdict. Methodical criminal. What baffled many people is how did Joseph manage to go his entire life doing what he did and never be caught. By analyzing the subject's actions from a distance, and listening to the witness talking about him, I can point out several factors that played in his favor. Such as. 1. He possessed the means and the opportunities to commit the crimes. 2. He was obsessively methodical. He never let down his guard, he reviewed every step he did always made sure all doors were locked when he went in and out of the cellar, and he adopted strict routines to make sure he kept everything under control. 3. He was lucky. Joseph actually did a few mistakes during his 24 years criminal career, but when he did them, he was lucky enough to not attract suspicions to him. 4. He was a handyman. Apart from his education as a mechanical engineer electrician, he also acquired knowledge from other jobs that made it possible for him to build and keep running the prison chamber with nobody's help. 5. He was collected and intelligent. Apart from the time he accepted Kirsten to be taken to the hospital, 
He never made a rash decision. He always paused and reflected on all the alternatives before doing anything. 6. He was a resourceful man. He always managed to be ahead of the problems or potential problems. For this reason, he was always prepared for any adversities or would quickly find solutions to solve the problems. 7. He was a master manipulator. He knew how to lie and manipulate people to do what he wanted. From the public image of the respected citizen to the control he exerted over his wife, to the lies he told the police, everyone believed in him. For instance, when he said Elizabeth was a problematic child and had run away to join a satanic cult, the police officers actually felt sorrow for him. 8. He never became lazy or overly confident. Many criminals are caught because they relax and start making mistakes. But Joseph never was like that, he kept vigilant and stuck to his routines. Wife's involvement. Taking into consideration the cellar was right underneath a residential building, with several people living there including guests, it's hard to believe that he went unnoticed for so long without raising suspicions. Others point their fingers at Rosemary Fritzel, Elizabeth's mother. They find it hard to believe she was completely unaware of Joseph's secret life in the basement. Some even suggested that she knew about everything, but decided to turn a blind eye and ignore it. In defense of Rosemary, family members have explained Fritzel was a tyrannical, domineering control freak who controlled meticulously every aspect of his life, as well the lives of the family members upstairs. Fritz's sister-in-law, said that every day around 9 o'clock he would descend to the basement to draw plans for machines that he sold to firms. He would often stay there for the night and did not allow his wife to go there, not even to bring him a coffee. It was his place, and he demanded to be left alone at all times. A tenant who rented a ground floor room in Fritzl's house for 12 years claimed that sometimes he heard noises coming from the basement. When he asked Joseph about it, he told him the noises were caused by faulty pipes or it was just the normal gas system working. Because Joseph and Rosemary were fostering Elizabeth's three other children, the family received regular visits from social workers. But they too were deceived by the appearances. They say that during the visits, they never saw or heard anything suspicious. Profiling the sex predator. Later reports have revealed Joseph's reason for imprisoning his daughter had nothing to do with discipline, but they were purely for his personal pleasure. Men like Fritzl have abnormal sexual fantasies, focused on obsessive thoughts of domination and total control of the victims. For a sex predator, rape is more enticing than consented sex. Self-diagnose. Joseph Fritzl stated that his behavior was innate, that he was born to rape. He also admitted to having started planning to lock up his daughter already during his first conviction for rape in 1967. Quote, I was born to rape, and I held myself back for a relatively long time. I could have behaved a lot worse than locking up my daughter. Unquote. Joseph was diagnosed with a severe combined personality disorder, including borderline, schizotypal, and schizoid personalities, and a sexual disorder and he was recommended to undergo treatment for the rest of his life. The Fritzl case is what happens when power and means are given to a sex predator. Sex predators are driven by their sexual deviant impulses. They lack morality and empathy for the victims, so they will hesitate at nothing to achieve their goals, which is to find a way to satisfy their deviant selfish personal pleasure. When it comes to sexuality, a sex predator and a serial killer are very similar in their core. Both lack empathy for the victims, both obtain pleasure with humiliation and complete domination of the victims, and both are sexual deviants who work tirelessly to fulfill their sexual desires. The only difference is that for serial killers, their sexual fantasies involve sadistic thoughts of torture and death. The Aftermath The Victims The Fritzl case is also one of the most macabre experiments ever done on a human being. Physicians say that it's impossible to survive without sunlight. The human body needs sunlight to process vitamin D. Vitamin D is needed to regulate body functions such as the amount of calcium and phosphate in the body. These nutrients are needed to keep bones, teeth, and muscles healthy. The lack of vitamin D can lead to bone deformities, such as rickets in children, and bone pain caused by a condition called osteomalacia in adults. 
The lack of sunlight also decreases the production of serotonin in the brain. It enables brain cells and other nervous system cells to communicate with each other. Serotonin, also known as the feel-good hormone, plays an important role in regulating the mental and physical processes in the body, such as sleeping, eating, and digestion. The hormone regulates the mood and promotes feelings of well-being and happiness. Without serotonin, the individual will fall into severe depression and have extreme mood swings. For 24 years, Elizabeth lived without seeing the light of the sun or was able to breathe fresh air. The children in the cellar were forced to grow in inhuman living conditions and never saw the outside world until their liberation. When the victims were finally rescued, Elizabeth and the three children who grew up in the cellar were taken to a psychiatric clinic to undergo extensive physical and mental treatment. After so many years of living in the darkness, they also required special treatment to help them adjust their eyes to the light of the sun. At the time of admission, the clinic's chief physician said, for them, a passing cloud is a phenomenon. Soon after her release, Elizabeth developed an obsession for cleanliness. It was reported she would shower over ten times a day. After her hospitalization, doctors weren't sure if Kirsten would survive or not. But in June 2008, she did fully recover from her illness and was reunited with her family. Kirsten's illness that had almost cost her life was never made public, but it has been reported she suffered from breathing difficulties and stomach cramps probably caused by the lack of fresh air, proper diet and the sun of the light. Kirsten's mental state was seriously deteriorated because of her inhumane living conditions. While in captivity, she tore out clumps of her hair, and in an incident narrated by her mother, she shredded her dress and stuffed it in the toilet, causing it to spill sewage into their living space. When Kirsten awoke from a seven-week artificially induced coma, she was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. Insignificant events such as a door closing, a light going off, or a room that's too small would often trigger a panic attack on Kirsten. Stefan, 18 at the time of his liberation, could not walk properly. With 172 centimeters, 5, 6 feet, tall, he was forced to stoop constantly in a room that's only 167 centimeters, 5, 4 feet, in height. He felt dizzy if he had to walk for longer than a short distance and doctors believed he may have permanent spinal damage. The damage done to the victims was so severe doctors believe they could need therapy for the rest of their lives. The other three children that grew up upstairs have mainly problems with anger and resentment because their lives were suddenly turned upside down. And all the children might have genetic problems common to children born of an incestuous relationship. In May 2008, after countless letters of support received by locals, Elizabeth and her children wrote a poster to thank them for the support. The poster was displayed in the Amstetten Town Center and reads as follows. We, the whole family, would like to take the opportunity to thank all of you for sympathy at our fate. Your compassion is helping us greatly to overcome these difficult times, and it shows us there also are good and honest people here who really care for us. We hope that soon there will be a time where we can find our way back into a normal life. After the clinic, to protect them from the media, Elizabeth and her children received new identities and were relocated to a small town of an undisclosed location. A team of bodyguards was also assigned to protect her family and to keep paparazzi at bay. Strict laws were implemented to prevent their new identities from ever being revealed. Locals from the town where she and her family leaves now are vigilant of any intruder and they quickly call the police if they see any outsider lurking around. It was revealed that a year after the trial, Elizabeth had started a relationship with one of the bodyguards assigned to protect her. And locals of the unknown village said that the family is doing well, and they seemed happy. Initially, Rosemary was living with Elizabeth and her children in the new house. But Elizabeth expressed trust issues about her mother's involvement in the ordeal. She believed it was impossible Rosemary did not know what was happening in the cellar. For this reason, Rosemary was asked to not return to the house. Yet Elizabeth did allow the three children who grew up with her grandmother to visit her once a week. Rosemary moved out of the house and started living in a small apartment. To supplement her meager pension, she began selling homemade bags and paintings of flowers. Later on, Elizabeth changed her mind about her mother's involvement and forgave her for having believing her father's story. Now Rosemary is once more welcome to visit the family at the villa, which she does regularly. 
It is reported the three children who grew up upstairs started slowly accepting Elizabeth as their mother and developed normal relationships with their other siblings. The children enjoyed being outdoors, playing video games, and spending time with their mother and grandmother. The house. In 2013, the infamous cellar in the basement was filled with cement, and the house was sold in the market to a private buyer. The building still exists, but it was remodeled with a new look. The perpetrator. Joseph Fritzl is imprisoned at Austria's Stein prison, a place he will stay until the day of his death. Years after his arrest, Joseph showed no remorse for his crimes. In an interview with a British reporter, he said. Just look into the cellars of other people. You might find other families and other girls down there. Joseph also added that he thinks he did nothing wrong and that his sentence was a failure of justice. In May 2017, Joseph Fritzl changed legally his name to Joseph Meerhoff. It's not clear why he changed his name. Some have speculated that it was an attempt to escape public scrutiny. But there's also a reported incident involving a false dating profile created by another inmate, using Joseph's name and picture. The result was that Joseph was involved in a fight and a few of his teeth were knocked out. More recently, in 2019, Joseph's cellmates reported Fritzl doesn't want to live anymore. He also said that Fritzl almost does not leave his cell and that the other inmates don't want to be involved with him. The authorities refuse to comment on Joseph's health, but it is believed he suffers from dementia. The following footage were taken by a Bilds journalist from inside the prison where Joseph has been held captive. I have started this YouTube channel mainly to promote my work as a writer. If you like reading, I would like to suggest to you my first novel. Those who have returned. It's a supernatural horror drama. Or, if you like my content, you can also subscribe or support me on Patreon so I can keep doing more videos. Thanks for watching the video until the end.